So the ability to summarize is a highly underrated communication skill. And you begin to realize this as a parent, especially when your kids begin to approach the age where they can read on their own. I remember asking our two boys, uh, oftentimes when they were younger, what they were reading. And as soon as I asked them, they would begin with the first page. Uh, for example, The Lightning Thief is the first installment of the Percy Jackson series, which is one of our kids' favorite uh, set of books they liked to read when they were younger. And they would begin with, well, Percy Jackson, dad, was this uh, dyslexic teenage kid. He goes on a field trip to an art museum. And one of the chaperones there turns out to, uh, actually is a fury. But thankfully, Percy's teacher, his favorite teacher, gives him this sort of magical pen, which is actually a sword to defeat the fury on that trip. And I'm realizing already that they're not going to summarize the book. They're going to summarize chapter one. Right? And, I, and I, I would explain to them, okay, what you need to learn is just you know, give me the gist of the story, the setting, the purpose, the movement. That's it. Maybe say instead, you know, it's a, it's a mashup of modern day kids with Greek gods who race across America to find Zeus's lightning bolt and save humanity. All right? That's, that's a summary. And that, having said that, I'd also have to admit to my kids, you have to do this because your dad has a very short attention span. All right, very little patience and an ever failing memory, ever deteriorating. I love what Oz Guinness said, uh, the great Oz Guinness. He said that no generation has had to forget as much as ours, right? Because of the uh, fire hose of information that's constantly coming our way, we have to forget a lot of things, which is why when we get a new set of information, we long to get it in things like TED Talks or DIY YouTube videos because we desire simplicity above all else so we can fit it in this brain of ours. We ask to simplify what I need to know, why I need to know it, right? The gist of something and the purpose for why I need it. That's what we want. That's why we're spending the rest of the summer in a series called My Role and God's Story. Because most Sundays we may go deep into a particular book of the Bible and apply it to our lives. Every once in a while it's good to step back and ask the question, okay, what's this all about? What's this big story all about if we could just summarize it? And it's this, that God created the world good, that man, however, decided to do bad, and in response, a God-man arrives to do something new, which anticipates a day and a world that will one day be perfect. So we have good, bad, new, perfect. And that's God's story in a nutshell. And it begins, this story, in a place called Eden. It's a special place where heaven and earth overlap. So there, there's, there's this free-flowing friendship between heaven and humanity. All things God creates in heaven are good. And that's what we learned about last week. All things God created are good. The humans aren't meant to be hands off that good, right? But as image bearers of God, they're called to collaborate with the good God has already made to enhance it. We are called to, to lovingly, and freely rule over all that God has made. And I say freely because God has given us this capacity to choose to love and to trust him. Genesis 2, verses 15 through 17. I'm going to read this really quickly. The Lord God took man and put him in the garden to work it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil... You shall not eat, for in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. So we hear here collaboration, loving rule, delighting in everything God has made, and the capacity to freely choose to love and trust God, or not love and trust Him. And it's the not that we're going to read about this morning. And in doing so, figure out why this story still matters for us and the role we have to play in it. So read with me Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, starting in verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God actually say, 
You shall not eat of any tree of the garden. And the woman responded to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will surely, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were open and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, well, I heard the sound of you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And God said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, well, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all the beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, you shall bruise his heel." To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain, you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And to Adam, he said, because you've listened to the voice of your wife, and eat the tree of the garden, uh, the, tree, the tree of which I commanded of you, you shall not eat. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring for you. You shall eat of the plants of the fields. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. The man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all the living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, doing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the garden of Eden he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. This is God's word. This is also act two of God's story, bad, act two, bad. If you never read this story before, one of the immediate questions that often comes from it is what the heck is the deal with this talking snake? All right, we, we open the story and a snake starts talking and it just sounds pretty weird. Um, we mentioned a moment ago that Eden is a special place where heaven and earth intersect. And as such, Eden is a kind of gateway or portal from which heavenly things can interact with earthly things. All right, and so what does this have to do with a snake? Well, the rest of the Old Testament fills in the details for us. The prophet Isaiah has this special vision in Isaiah chapter 6. He has a vision in which he is, is brought into the heavenly throne room of God. And above the throne, God's throne, are the, these heavenly creatures called seraphim. And seraphim literally mean snakes or fiery serpents. They're, they're at this time members, you could say, of God's staff. They're on his staff. And the prophet Ezekiel fills in some more details telling us that a particular member of God's staff no longer wants to love and trust God, but rather trust himself and be like God himself. So what we see here is one of these seraphim using the portal that is Eden to move between heaven and earth because having been cast out of heaven, this seraphim wants to take down others with him, right? I've, I've been cast out of heaven. I'm going to take down others with me. And doing so, his hope is to forever separate earth from heaven. And they, that, you know what? Maybe if I separate these two things, God can rule heaven and I can rule earth. 
And he's successful in his plan. As we find out in Genesis chapter 3, humanity gets caught up in this plan. And this story gets replayed every day now on earth. The story of Genesis chapter 3. And the question is, how might we play a role in reversing this, this terrible act in God's story? Well, here's the first role. The first role is this. Well, there's four of them. First role is this. It's to tell myself the truth about what tempts me. Just to be real and honest about what tempts me. Because now and then the serpent whispers to us half-truths that tempt us away from God's good. And we see these, this litany of half-truths that the serpent tells, right? In this first five or six verses. Verse 1, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? Well, of course he didn't say that. No, God was quite generous in the trees he could, they could eat from. But he's just trying to begin his conversation with Eve by confusing her. Verse 4, you will not surely die. Well, technically Adam does live 930 years. So the serpent's words probably start to ring true after year 100, right? You think at least, like, oh, maybe, maybe he was right. But in the end, Adam dies. Verse 5, another half-truth. God knows your eyes will be open, which is technically true, but their eyes would be open to nakedness and shame, which is bad. Verse 5, you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, even God agrees with this first part of this. Verse 22, he says, I remember of the Trinity, they become like one of us, knowing good and evil. But knowledge of evil isn't all that helpful if it only harms you, right? And that's what happens here. They can no longer stay in God's presence because God cannot tolerate evil in his presence. If they were to continue to eat of the tree of life, that means they would live forever outside of the presence of God, separated from him. So God lovingly and temporarily kicks them out of the garden lest they eat of that tree of life and live forever separated from him. Well, all of these half-truths that the serpent tells builds to the woman's self-justification of why she's going to indulge in sin. Verse 6, well, this forbidden free tree, right? It's good for food. It's a delight to the eyes, just like the other trees that God described earlier, back in chapter 2. And you can hear her, you can hear the justification coming in her mind. You could hear the half-truth building in her head. Well, if God was really, you know, if, if this tree was really so bad, wouldn't God make the tree ugly and make it taste terrible, the fruit? But it's beautiful, and the fruit seems like it's going to taste good. Like having endured the onslaught of half-truths, then the woman makes up one of her own and indulges in eating it. And I can relate. I can, I can relate not just to the story in general, but to the specific half-truth that Eve develops. Listen, listen, I love my wife, Katie. She's back in the kids' ministry right now, helping out. I love her deeply. In my eyes, uh, she's, she's a role model to me in so many ways and, and God's standard of beauty for me. But I'd be lying to you if I said I never uh, looked at another woman uh, with some degree of lust, all right? And that may be hard to hear from you from your pastor, but I'm just being real with you. Especially in my younger days, but even in these days, when I'm out driving and, and I'll notice, a be we live in California, it's sunny out, I'll notice sometimes a beautiful woman, you know, in, in yoga pants, <laughs> walking or jogging by. I tend to notice, and the first notice isn't the problem. It's not. The problem is the second notice, the second look in the rearview mirror when I'm driving. It's always a second look in the rearview mirror because then she's in my thoughts. Maybe I'm even daydreaming about her. She's on a kind of wish list of mine. So I'm sinning against God in that moment. I'm sinning against my wife, and I'm sinning against this woman because I put her on a kind of Amazon wish list like she's an object, right? I've done all of these things. Because I took that second look in the rearview mirror, which is why I bought an electric bike to commute. No rearview mirror. I actually really did get an electric bike, but not for that reason. I just came on it today, actually, to church. But, but here's, here's the point. 
Here's how I begin to justify that in my mind. Well, God made beautiful people. Genesis 1, God made beautiful people in his image. So if he made them, it's okay to look and then look again. See what I've done? Part of that's true. God made people in his image, made them beautiful. Part of it's not so much, right? Let's define temptation here. I'm going to define it simply. It's the dangling of life-taking fruit. The dangling before your face of light taking fruit. The serpent dangles temporary beauty and the taste of sin in front of our face. We're then responsible for what happens next. Martin Luther had a great way of putting this. He had a great little saying he said about temptation. He said, you, can't, you cannot keep birds from flying over your head, but you can keep them from making a nest in your hair. Right? Either you look at temptation and say to it one of my life's mantras, one of my three life mantras, which is there is no life in that. Either you point at temptation, you say to yourself, there's no life in that. Or you develop a half-truth to justify indulging in that sin. How do we respond then? Be honest about what tempts you. You're familiar with what is specifically tempting from you, from what you try to get life that can't really give you life. Write it down. Even now, write it down to remind yourself now, there is no life in that. And tell that to yourself and to that temptation whenever it comes your way. My second role in God's story here is to take responsibility for my sin. To tell myself the truth about what tempts me, take responsibility for my sin. Let's take a moment to define what sin is. I don't want to assume we all know. Sin is that big no that begins in our hearts and shows up through our actions. And infants are the best empirical evidence for sin in this world. One of these days, I just want to take a, a newborn baby. It's hard as a pastor because new moms don't want you to do this. But I want to take a newborn baby and just say to it, you cute little bundle of sin. And again, like moms don't like that. They prefer you, you know, pray for the baby, etc. I would. But, but, but how is it that infants, most of whom have not heard the word no, still find a way to fling the baby food back in your face? right? Where does that come from? We're all born with this no in our hearts towards someone else telling us what's going to be good for us. And we say, no, I want to define that for myself. God is telling Adam and Eve what is good for them. And Adam and Eve decide, you know what? I don't think so, God. Your idea of good, we want to define good for ourselves. It's interesting, the Hebrew word for shrewd or crafty, which is said here of the serpent, right? Sounds almost identical and looks almost identical to the Hebrew word for nude. The shrewd, crafty, nude. In other words, the author does this on purpose, a play on words. He's, he is saying to us, hey, you craftily want to define good on your own. You're going to end up with shame and pain. You're going to end up naked and nude. The reality is, all of us at one point or another will give in to sin, but like Adam and Eve, the problem is we develop these sin management strategies, two of which we see in our story. I want to point out both. Blame is the public sin management strategy, right? And we all laughed at these verses earlier, verses 11 through 13, when, who told you you're naked? And the man said, the woman whom you... You gave me, she, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. Adam manages to blame two people in one sentence, right? You, God, gave me this woman and it's also her fault. And then the woman immediately, <laughs> she's like, what? Well, I'm blaming the serpent. Of course, this is our nature. Not too long ago, I was listening to, to two longtime therapists and they were asked about what the number one cause of breakups is that they have seen through their decades of working with couples. And they said the number one cause of breakups isn't, you know, uh, lack of communication or issues with money. It was blame. It is by far blame. They said, they went on to say as human beings, we don't want to clean up our own yard. We rather focus on someone else's, especially the, the person living next to us. 
We just don't want to take care of our own yard. We want to focus on others. And I feel that. I mean, I'm aware of my own often concealed sin, but just in case it gets revealed, I stand armed and ready to point out someone else's, especially my own wife's, <laughs> especially the person living right next to me. And then we have shame. And shame is the private strategy for sin management. We see that in verses 8 through 10, right? Read with that with me again. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid. They hid themselves in the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. God has to call out to them, and he says, I heard the sound of you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And our thinking goes something like this. You know, if I keep my sin private, well, then it won't hurt others, right? No one has to know, but no matter what, God knows. And hiding from God only causes a sense of not only an alienation from him, but an alienation from ourselves. We become less ourselves, alienation from the world around us. We become less ourselves to others, and they don't see us for who we really are. So it's just this alienation that keeps perpetuating. Now, hiding in shame usually comes from a high view of humanity and a low view of God. God remembers that we are dust. In fact, he reminds us of it here in Genesis 3. He also says it in Psalm 103 that he remembers that we are dust. We are weak. He expects more failure from us than we expect from ourselves. And yet we have this very high bar sometimes for ourselves that's way up here. We also have too low a view of God oftentimes, right? Adam believes in this moment that either God cannot see his sin, so he hides from him, or that he won't forgive it, that he's no longer good as he says he was. Remember in 2019 when Boeing had to remove a lot of their airplanes, some of their newer airplanes, they were the, the MAX 737 planes, they had to remove them from use because they twice led to major crashes in Indonesia and Ethiopia, leading to the deaths of over 300 people. There was a huge investigation, a congressional investigation into the airplanes, manufacturing, and into Boeing, the business itself, which revealed what they officially deemed a culture of concealment. Culture of concealment was the, was the main cause of why this happened. Not only were the, were the workers hiding, concealing technical mistakes, oversights, but upper management frowned upon them admitting them because it would reduce efficiency for, their, for, for, for the creating of these airplanes. And so you had this, this culture from, from employees, employers of concealment that was being perpetuated. A culture of concealment that led to death, and that's what a culture of concealment does. It leads to death, not only in businesses, but in any organization, even in churches. Oh, oh, that us, the Spirit of God would work in our church a culture of authenticity, of being real with each other about our struggles with sin and temptation. Now listen, guys, you've heard me encourage you and compliment you a lot. A lot of times I sit up here and say, Man, I love this about our church. But I'm not going to pull an encouragement sandwich on you this morning, okay? I'm just going to deliver it to you straight. I mean, been here a year, I think this is an area in which God... We could really use God's help. I don't hear a lot of people in our church just be real about sin and temptation in their lives when conversations go on. And maybe that's because we need more avenues for it, more to come on that. In September, we're going to be opening up a new avenue for fellowship and community. But we need to grow, I think, in that area, if I can be real. But it's hard. I know it's hard. I mean, who wants to come out of hiding and be authentic about giving in to sin and talk about it over coffee? Who wants to subject themselves to that, right? How can we even muster up the courage to do it? Well, I'm going to get to that in a moment. But first, let me get to our third role we see in God's story here, and that is to own the consequences of sin. Own the consequences or take responsibility for sin, but also own the consequences of it. After Adam and Eve fall into temptation, God lays out consequences for them and for all humanity as a result. 
So we see, first of all, pain in verse 16. We see relational discord also in verse 16, which describes what will be a constant power struggle in a marital relationship. We see creational discord in verses 17 and 18. The natural world is going to cause us pain. It's not going to cooperate. We see work frustration in verses 17 through 19, that to which we put our minds and our hands It's going to frustrate us. It's not going to work like it's supposed to. We see death, verse 19. We're going to turn back into dust. And worst of all, we see relational separation from God, verses 22 through 24. And the reason God puts this here in front of us is to say, this is what has happened as a result of your sin. He's calling us to own these consequences, to remind ourselves every so often, I deserve this. I actually deserve this. And you may object, well, wait a minute, Ryan. These things weren't my fault. I didn't do these things specifically. Well, have have you ever given in to the dangling of life taking fruit? Have you ever reached out to it and snatched it for yourself? And if so, you've merely replayed Genesis 3 in your own life, as we all have, as I have. But that means confessing that we deserve some of the pain, maybe not all of it. I'm not saying everything bad comes your way is your fault. Some of that is a mystery of evil. But it means sometimes saying that we deserve some of that pain, some of that relational discord, some of that frustration with work. And the knowledge that this was God's plan for us and that he uses such consequences to drive us back to him, right? To, to, to reach out to him, to need him. And that these consequences aren't his final say in the story. That there's good news ahead. Now, our mission as a church is to help people flourish in the good news about Jesus. That the good news We want to introduce people to the good news about Jesus, but also remind them that same good news is to help us in every aspect of life. When we're struggling in relationships, to compel us to share the good news with our neighbors, the good news does all of this. And the reason it's core to our mission is because we are convinced that God's message to us always ends in good news. And that's true of even the saddest act in God's story even in Genesis chapter 3, which leads to our fourth role, which is to embrace the sacrifice of the serpent crusher. To embrace the sacrifice of the serpent crusher. Read with me in verses 14 through 15. The Lord said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock, above the beasts of the fields. On the belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between You and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. What does that mean by this? That that her offspring will bruise the serpent's head. So after chapter 3 concludes, Genesis immediately gets in to how Adam and Eve have offspring, which results ultimately in their son, Seth. And Genesis 5 then says right away how the rest of the book is about the generations of Adam. So going forward, this is going to be about the generation, the rest of Genesis, and indeed the entire Old Testament is going to trace Adam and Eve's offspring to a person who will ultimately crush the serpent and undo the work that he did in separating earth from heaven. Notice though how he's going to crush the serpent. It's through the bruising of his own heel. In other words, the future offspring will win through suffering. He will win through pain. Bookmark that for a moment, if you will. But first, we also have to look at verse 21. As they're leaving the garden, God makes for Adam and for his wife garments of skins. These are animal skins, right? Garments of skins, and he clothed them. And God displays his goodness in this, right? He literally covers their shame with animal skins. But why? They had, earlier, they sowed fig leaves, right? Fig leaves seem fine. Why do we got to kill an animal over this? What's the deal with the animal skins? Well, remember how we talked in the very beginning about heaven and earth intersecting in this place called Eden, right? Heaven and earth come together. Inside of Eden, there's a garden. And inside that garden... 
There's the tree of life, which is like the hot spot of God's presence. Eden, garden, tree of life, the hot spot of God's presence. Well, after heaven and earth are separated because of humanity's sin, God still wants to meet with his people. He still wants to know them from time. So he creates first a tabernacle and then a temple as you get on to the Old Testament. And inside the tabernacle, there's an outer courtyard. And then there's an entry room. And inside that entry room, there's the Holy of Holies, which is now the hot spot of God's presence. And God says the only way to make up or cover Cover that shame, just like God kind of, remember, covered Adam and Eve here. Cover that shame, cover that sin in your life is with another life. So animal sacrifices creates this kind of clean space where humans can meet with God personally, face to face. So as they're leaving Eden and God covers their shame with animal skins, what he's saying is this, I'm not leaving you for good. I'm going to meet with you through sacrifice in a tabernacle then one day a man named Jesus shows up and he, his friend John says of him that he's literally, he literally tabernacled among us. He is the tabernacle. So Eden, Eden, the garden, the tree anticipate the temple courtyard, the entry room, the Holy of Holies, which anticipates a permanent solution, a human tabernacle who sacrifices his life once for all so we can be in the fullness of God's presence forever. The offspring. This is God's greatest news at humanity's lowest hour. That the serpent crusher would one day sacrifice his life to reunite heaven and earth and you to God. And that all you have to do is embrace Jesus Christ, the serpent crusher. Now, not only is this theologically necessary, it's emotionally necessary as well. Think about it. What, what kind of sadist would want to take to do all the roles that I described earlier? Who'd want to subject himself or herself to the things I described, right? To tell myself the truth about what tempts me, to take responsibility for sin, to own the terrible consequences of sin in their lives. Who would volunteer for that? The only way we raise our hand and do these things is to know that we will forever be loved and accepted on the other side of it. That we know that for sure. We're going to be loved and accepted on the other side of living out those roles. And that's the assurance we get with the serpent crusher, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, as hard as it is to replay Genesis 3, we know that it's hard because we replay it in our lives every day. And Father, we need to own that. We need to be prepared to work the strategies to fight against that, but we also need to own it, take responsibility for it. But we're thankful that we can take responsibility for it. We can raise our hands and admit we struggle, admit our temptations, our sin. We can, we can, we can say sometimes, you know what, I deserve this. We can have the courage to do that because of the serpent crusher Jesus, because he gave his life for us. And in doing so, assuring us that we can be in God's presence and know him forever. And we can and we do through trusting him. Help us be the kind of church that's just real about our struggles. That's real about temptation. That's real about sin when it happens. Because we know we're loved and accepted by you no matter what. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.